Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as you've heard, my name's Peter O'Halloran. I work at the National Blood Authority. Um, unlike, I'm guessing 99% of you in the room probably haven't heard of us, and that's probably a good thing, which means hopefully we're doing our job. Um, I wear a couple of hats in the authority. The first part is I'm responsible for all our services to hospitals across and health care services across Australia, and so we call that, because I'm from bureaucratic organisation, health provider engagement. And so I look after a lot of that side. I also, for my sins, wear the other hat of IT, so I'm also the Chief Information Officer for the National Blood Authority. Um, I thought I'd do the, the, the traditional five second spiel about who we are, what we do and how it works. In essence, the National Blood Authority is a small Commonwealth Government agency. There's 80 or so of us, so we're basically a rounding error for most hospitals in terms of staff numbers. We buy and sell blood and blood products. We work for nine governments, so I answer to nine health ministers, each state and territory and the Australian government. <laughs> Let's just say it's uh, challenging. Nine auditors general, and of course, because all governments are paying, every decision is made on consensus. So I have to convince nine health departments that we actually need to do something. So you can imagine the fun we have. Um, but we fund the Red Cross with things like fresh blood products. Uh, and work with various pharmaceutical companies, the usual suspects, CSL, Pfizer, Baxalter and the like, to fund the sort of things such as clotting factors, immunoglobulins, albumin and the like. That's sort of the first part and that's our core business. And then that core business costs about 1.1 to 1.2 billion Australian dollars per annum. So it's a, it's a reasonable amount of money we're spending on of taxpayers' money. The second part we're now involved a lot more in is in terms of appropriate use. So developing clinical guidelines about the best way to actually manage a patient in their care. So that's the whole range of patient blood management guidelines. We're now moving into the other space such as quality improvement programs around the use of immunoglobulin products. And of course our bread and butter things like inventory management, decreasing wastage and the like. So to set the scene a little bit more, I want to talk to you a bit about what's happening with red cell demand in Australia. Those of you from overseas, this is not an unusual trend. I'd love to say Australia's leading the way, but quite frankly, we're about five years behind the rest of the world. Red cell demand over the last three financial years has decreased by approximately 18% in Australia. And that's the first time in history in Australia it's decreased. Set against that, the fact that healthcare activity in Australia over the same period has increased by about between 12 and 14% based on which measure you want to look at. So you could actually assume in real terms that the demand for red cells has actually decreased by nearly a third in three years. That is a fairly major change in business. And that doesn't mean patients are being under transfused or they're being undermanaged and that they're going home with terrible haemoglobins that are going to cause some real issues. It simply means now that we're getting the guidelines and the evidence and the tools out there to help clinicians better manage patients and their care. And that's something we're really quite proud of. So I'm going to do about five minutes or so to talk about crystal ball gazing of where I think transfusion labs could be in the next 10 years. Very much going down the virtual medicine path. What I'm going to talk about, the technology for all, uh, probably one of the things I'm going to talk about is already out there in production in many labs or hospitals across the world now. So this is nothing that's actually rocket science, it's just taking it through. If you're setting up a new transfusion service tomorrow, a new hospital, a new pathology service, what would it look like? How would it work? And bear in mind, of course, the technology is the easy part, it's the cultural change, it's the fun bit. So first of all, there will be a lot more automation. There will be a lot more machine learning. It will be much smarter. If you look at where we're going now, decision support is, in most laboratory information systems, pretty rudimentary. You'll see a lot of this come out of analyzers and the like. Consider doing X, or consider doing Y. That will become a lot more sophisticated and you'll see that change a lot more in the coming years. In the States and various other places, the computerized physician order entry from the ward, from the bedside, is commonplace. In Australia, this is still something that's relatively new for us in most places. The work at the moment going on to roll out EMRs across most of the public hospitals in Australia, we're now starting to work a lot more with state and territory health departments about actually how do we get appropriate and useful guidance rather than just 25 annoying pop-ups on screen so that when that's actually being done at the bedside or in the ward, we're giving the clinicians relevant information that draws from both guidelines and data from the patient's history to actually help guide them down the right path. And so we expect that will actually start continuing a lot more. Electronic cross-matching has been around for a long time. This is nothing new. But less than half the laboratories in Australia are actually doing it. Increasingly, that is, that we're seeing that number increase year on year, primarily based around the fact that as people upgrade to more modern versions of systems, 
as they go through budget cut number 37, they actually start looking at how they're doing their business and starting to make it more efficient. That is starting to come now. We're also seeing places like automated remote release of blood. So if you look at, say, the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, all of the testing in the single soul laboratory covering all those public hospitals is based around the John Hunter in Newcastle. There's another 10 or 15 hospitals that they support in the same geographic region within sort of maximum two hour drive from Newcastle. But each of those, lab, each of those hospitals doesn't actually have a lab anymore. They've got a remote fridge that's monitored and managed through the LIS. So what happens is the phlebotomist takes a sample. It's in the Hunter, so it's actually not, nothing's really far from anywhere. It's driven back to the John Hunter, tested, and the results, and then the blood is remotely released from the main lab. We see that happening a lot more now. What we're doing some work on at the moment, in fact, there's a trial we've got starting on Monday next week in Victoria is actually looking at how do we actually then use RFID technology to actually manage what's going on in those fridges. It's all well and good to say remote release and you can trust people and the scientists will bring it out and it'll be cross-checked by the, the porter or by the, the nurse and so forth. As we're moving increasingly to the idea that it'll be sim simply there'll be some form of automated system, the nurse will simply go and grab the bag and use it. How do we use RFID to actually ensure that bag is the only one pulled out of the fridge that it actually was in the cold chain the whole time? And so we're starting to see that moving now. And also much greater use of analyzers. Um, what is disturbing to see is still a number of group checks you see done manually by hand in public, um, public pathology services. And over the last two years, we've seen particularly, say, New South Wales, quite a move away from doing these things to doing a lot more automated, manners, automated manner of doing the checks. We see analyzers being used a lot more, and we see them being used a lot more now by less skilled staff. And we'll touch on the staff changes in a minute. In terms of patients, and the top one here is the one that actually the technology is kind of there but not really yet. Looking at the idea that you can actually use an essence equivalent of a small pill a patient can swallow, it does do the tests on their blood in real time and can report back. This is, there are a number of experiments going on overseas looking at this type of area. We actually see that technology being the one that will make the most difference. It won't be there for every patient, it won't work for a lot of them. But if you look at, say, someone with haemophilia, we've got in round numbers, what, 1,000 people in Australia who have haemophilia who go through about $150 million a year worth of product. You think about the numbers there. You've got someone who's on a chronic condition for life. On average, those patients are going through at least a $1 million a year worth of product. If you can actually start tweaking their doses slightly based on whether it's their weight changes, so you're changing the dose in real time, or actually looking at things such as long-acting clotting factors where the, the half-life is much longer, you don't have to give them as frequent a dose, actually measuring their blood and determining when the best time is to actually have the next dose will make a major difference in terms of cost to governments, but also offset the cost of moving to the, the higher cost things such as the, uh, the enhanced screening in real time. The other part we're also seeing, and this is one that we're particularly hopeful and we're putting a lot of work into, is continuing the trend of red cell demand decreasing. Very much actually focusing on patients getting the underlying conditions being treated rather than simply being topped up with a bag of red cells before they're pushed out the door. Um, and that's something we're doing, I'd say, probably about a third of our effort at the agency is currently focused on, and we're seeing real returns, and we're seeing clinicians and patients both reporting improved outcomes, which is really the thing you want. It's quite strange that I work for an organisation that's trying to put itself out of business, but it's working and it's working well. Um, and this is perhaps the biggest change we're seeing, is our expectations are that within 10 years, when people are setting up new hospitals or setting up new pathology services, the hospital or pathology service generally won't actually exist. Pathology might be a single room in the, in the hospital where there's a couple of analyzers, the phlebotomist or the nurse or whoever's drawing the blood will take it down. It's already tagged, they'll load into the analyzer. The results are uploaded into the LIS from there and somebody who's off site actually does all the work. We're starting to see this now, particularly if you look at say somewhere like Sydney, you look at the Douglas Hanley Moyo Laboratories across Sydney, part of Sonic Pathology, so biggest single private path service in Australia, you're starting to see already the high level of automation they're doing where basic things are done out in their satellite labs. The vast majority of the work is done in the main lab in Macquarie Park. So my prediction, and this is the truly depressing one given how much I hate call centres, is I would suggest that within 10 years you'll start to see you won't actually have transfusion scientists working in large hospitals. They'll increasingly be moving to the point that you'll have and it might be, the call centre might still be based in a hospital, but you might find in New South Wales, there's only going to be half a dozen core hospitals that really have transfusion scientists in bulk on site. 
everywhere else that are increasingly moving to the data in the systems. They can do the work from anywhere. As you'll find, transfusion scientists are a dying profession in terms of numbers coming in and skill sets in the sector. We presume, we presume that will continue to go the way it is at the moment. And we're already seeing at the moment a lot of the advice and all the transfusion scientist expertise, for example, for country New South Wales, is actually being provided out of the Westmead Hospital in Western Sydney. So this is already happening now, but we see it accelerating and actually being solidified. So there's actually a vaguely depressing outlook for transfusion, I would have thought in some ways, but maybe not. What it actually means is we're providing the care for the patients where they need it. The scientists increasingly will be moving away from non-value adds to actually being involved. So where is their scientific expertise actually going to help in the outcomes of the patients? And so the idea, as we were discussing previously, in terms of testing at once, but many, uh, testing many times and doing small incremental changes, that will be a key change pushing through in terms of transfusion. So I'm from the government, I'm here to help and it doesn't cost any money. So what's the National Blood Authority actually going to do to help and enable this? And there's a whole host of programs they're running, most of which are probably not relevant to changing in terms of what's like pathology, but the three key ones I want to focus on today. First of all, we're doing an awful lot of work on the supply chain, making it solid and robust. In the last 10 years, the National Blood Authority has only been around for 12 years, there has not been a single stock out for a non-fresh manufactured product, except where the whole product was withdrawn by the supplier or recalled. Compare that to how often do you see in the press that there's a stock out or there's a shortage of everything from sort of simple Panadols right through to a variety of other agents. We don't have that now on the non-fresh side. We've got supply contracts in place, in-country reserve, inventory management aspects that mean that you don't actually run out of those products. What we're now doing is pushing that work out across the fresh side. So actually saying if we have a decrease of red cell demand by 18%, how do we make what's left far more robust and solid? And so we're doing an awful lot of work on the supply chain so that actually if you order it, it will always be there. And that's even doing simple things such as working with people around the use of, say, O-neg blood. Eight to nine percent of the population are O-neg and yet it's 14 percent of issues. How do we maximise that and really try and tune the supply chain? Secondly, we're doing an awful lot of work around automation and providing data feeds in real time. And so, for example, a, a recent request that we're dealing with is actually the New South Wales Ambulance Service. How do they get real-time inventory access to our inventory levels of all the hospitals across New South Wales to know what's where? So if they've got an aeromedical retrieval service, they know they can go to hospital X or Y or Z based on a variety of factors. The number of the available theatres, their existing caseload, blood supplies and so forth. So that's the type of stuff we're now starting to do that's quite different than two years ago, five years ago, we wouldn't have really thought about. And the final thing we're working on is a single online way of ordering all blood and blood products. We process over 5 million units a year. We fund 1.1, 1.2 billion dollars a year worth of products and yet you have to go, it's day X, it's this product, so I have to order from that supplier, but because they're not open on this day, I've got to send a fax over here and so forth. What we're doing is over the next two years, we're bringing it to a single interface where any staff in pharmacy or in the pathology laboratory can place a single order in a single manner. The second thing we're doing, and this is my pet project, I could talk for hours about barcodes and RFIDs, I really need to get out more, um, is we're changing the barcode standards in Australia. So Australia has been, what, 10 years plus behind the rest of the world in terms of where we're going with standards for barcodes for fresh blood products. We have now made a decision, and we made it about two years ago, and I've got all government signing off on it, and it's now the Red Cross are implementing, that we move to the use of ISBT 128 for barcode for fresh blood products. And on the manufactured side, GS1. This sounds like a very simple, easy thing to say, but what it does mean is that suddenly all the data elements we're capturing, the way it all works is standardised and the same. It means when you're working with software vendors, if their system is already coping with these standards that are implemented correctly in other countries, it will work here. So it does actually bring down those costs. The benefit of coming late to the party is we'll also be the first country in the world to go to the two-dimensional data matrix barcodes for ISBT 128. So we're doing away with, you see a bag of blood now, there's sort of four or five barcodes, a whole variety of other information that's not in a um, machine readable format. There'll be a single data matrix, either ISBT 128 or GS1, on the bag, on the vial, on the shipper, that actually has all the details about that product. And on the manufactured side, we actually started, where are we, seven days ago, 1st of November, we actually started the first round of products being shipped out by Griffles in Australia for IG products. 
with the new barcode symbology. So that's coming in over the next four years and you'll see linear barcodes disappearing, being replaced by a data matrix that has a number of key data elements. Over time, we can add more. RFID, I love RFID. I'm so excited by it, but I can't actually make the dollars ever stack up. Um, in essence, where we're looking at it, RFID does not work and is not economical to the point of the laboratory processing a bag of blood. It, to do the work with blood, it generally involves picking up the bag, looking at it, working with it. If we can fix the barcode standards to a single read, that's great and you get most of the benefits. Compare it to the current process, yes, it would be better, but with the new barcode standards we get the same outcome for a fraction of the cost. Where we are seeing the benefits of RFID is actually looking at it from the point of cross-match. So when the blood is allocated to a patient and leaves the laboratory, goes off to a remote blood fridge, whether it's in theatres, whether it's in an off-site facility or the like, that's where we're starting to see the possible benefits. And in fact, we're starting a trial next week in Victoria at half a dozen private hospitals, looking at how do you know the blood has actually been in cold chain the whole time? How's it always been in the fridge? How do we get rid of the paper fridge registers that no one ever actually uses properly and you never really know what's there? So that's the part where we're going and that's a trial we think will hopefully be quite useful. The other part we're working on is some further systems development. Those of you who don't live and breathe blood like I do, it's kind of sad, um, we have an online ordering and inventory management system, almost in some ways I suppose the e eBay of blood perhaps, uh, called Bloodnet. It's been around for seven years now. Um, if you're from other countries, if you're say from the UK, OBOS, the online blood ordering system, was actually based on Bloodnet, ironically enough. I think we should have got royalty payments. Um, and it replaces a variety of other things. What it's also doing, and this is part of the change where we're now getting traceability to improvements, is the information we're capturing through that also looks at what actually happened to the bag of blood. So not only do I know you ordered it, you received it, which is good to know from a supply management perspective, but also if you're the one responsible for paying a billion dollars a year with the taxpayer's money, you actually want to know that someone received the product. Now I know what your inventory is, and I know what happened to the unit. Was it given to a patient? Was it sent to another hospital and so forth? So we're starting to get that information. Most of that is being done through poor staff in laboratories doing double and triple keying of information, which is not ideal. But compared to what it replaced, it's still an improvement, and that's truly scary to say. But the part we're working on the most, and this is the part that really does excite me, is actually interfacing. How do we link ultras and LIS or the various other ones out there with blood nets so you don't actually have staff keying at once? Or keying, sorry, you do have them keying at once, you don't have them keying at three times. So this is one of the key things, and this is probably the single biggest project the MBA has been working on in this space for the last five years, is actually getting the information flows. And so I'll take you through it. What the interface looks at doing is on the top, we receive information from the Red Cross. This is the unit that's been shipped to a hospital. This is the details right down to the phenotypes and all sorts of variety of information. We then feed that through the hospital laboratory staff, record in blood that they've received the unit, and that's simply a barcode scan. That information then fed straight through to the LIS. And that feeds through in a machine readable format. Not only the data that was currently on the front of the bag in barcode formats, but also other data elements, collection date and time, phenotypes that weren't all in a machine readable format as well. So you're getting an enhanced data stream in a much faster manner. The other part we're doing is coming out of the LIS down the bottom two parts. Every 15 minutes, it feeds back the real-time inventory. So what that means is every 15 minutes I can tell you, for a site that's interfaced, what's in their fridge, what's available for a patient should something happen and come, the patient comes through the door. And if you think about Australia and some of the joys we have of the charity of distance, um, particularly in northern Queensland, cyclones, actually knowing what's in the fridge and available at a certain time is quite important. If you go back a couple of years ago where we had the cyclones up here, there's a whole lot of fog, bridges were knocked out for road and rail. And for a couple of days, the way they were getting products, urgent products in was by helicopter. And the problem also, though, that happened was a whole lot of fog came in after the, after the rain. And so we had a case for platelets, maximum of four days from the time it's actually finished processing of the blood service until it's expired. Three times they sent a helicopter from Brisbane up north trying to get platelets in. Three times they turned back. They made it through on the fourth go. So the ability of us to actually know in real time and look at this on a map and say what is where in the fridge and the ability to move from X to Y is really very important. And the fate at the bottom is also the other key one, is actually looking at what happened to the unit. It was issued to you. Did you transfer it to another site? 
Did it get transfused to a patient? If it did, what are some of the details about the patient? Was it cross-matched half a dozen times until it was used and so forth? So actually looking at the ability of capturing that data in real time. So the data is recorded in the LIS, it feeds in through our systems, we then feed it back to states and territory governments and health departments, and relevant information goes onto the blood service. This isn't vaporware. Currently 24% of the national blood supply in Australia is interfaced in this manner, and we've been doing a whole lot of work with Hugh and his team um, in recent months on looking at interfacing ultra into BloodNet. So this is actually something that is really coming a long way. We currently have contracts in place that should see up to 65% of Australian blood supply interfaced by the end of the financial year. So this is starting to make real benefits and real differences. And what are we seeing out of it? Well, if you work in a laboratory or you have to fund one, the simple reality is it saves money. Everything else, yes, that's nice and everyone will want all those things, but reality is the National Blood Authority funds the interfaces, the laboratories get the staff saving. So if you look at Royal North Shore in Sydney, so decent sized tertiary hospital, they identified they save 17 and a half hours a week of staff time with this interface. Things are quicker, they move faster, it just gets there. That's how we sell it to pathology laboratories. The way I sell it to governments is very simple. We've got a much cleaner, accurate set of data. We can do benchmarking. I can sit there and do a cross-match transfusion ratio and work out who's doing what practice. That, of course, particularly in the private side, then cuts into billing processes and are there perverse incentives where, for example, you get funded an awful lot of money to do a cross-match and so forth when it may not actually be indicated. So that gets me into the political side, which is always fun. But it also enables us to feed data back to the hospitals as well and to the laboratories. So we do things such as, our view is the data comes in, if it's your data from your hospital, of course you get it back. So the laboratories in real time can either do a complete data dump for their data, or we'll give them nice little canned reports. And this is one that goes out every month. How old blood is when it gets to a patient is one of the key discussion points that seems to constantly come up. Of course, being from government, I have no views on these matters. There's no evidence to say that old blood is bad for you. Um, but let's just ignore common sense for a moment. If you look at it, at the top, that's a graph that simply shows in the bars how old was the blood when it was actually issued to the laboratory from the Red Cross blood service. You actually see this, this site's doing pretty well. And this is real data I've just taken off, obviously, the, the name of the hospital. But everyone thinks the guy down the road is always getting a better deal than they are. They're always suffering. Someone else is getting newer, fresher, better than they are. So what we overlay is two lines. The red line actually says, well, actually, compared to the national average, this is how you're tracking. So the red line up the top is actually what's the average age of blood nationally. And the green line is your state and territory. So we're actually starting to give people back information not only on their own stuff, but how they're performing compared to everybody else or what are they receiving. We then look at the bottom, and this is actually where the laboratory information system interface really comes into its own. That's all well and good, and we push the Red Cross very hard to get fresh blood out the door pretty fast. And if you look at the data, that's actually good. That's, that's pretty impressive performance. You look at the bottom graph and you suddenly have a different perspective, which is, and this is, by the way, one of the best hospitals in Australia for managing um, getting inventory out and blood out to patients quickly. You don't want to see the bad ones. They're still, they get the blood fairly fresh, but you look, so day to, down to 17, day 18, they're still pushing a lot of blood out the door that far through. So what we're now doing is saying, well, actually, you're getting it nice and fresh, but then you're sitting on it. And are you sitting on it more than the average? And so here we've got a state average. This hospital's pretty much spot on, and this is one jurisdiction, and I'm sure some of you can probably guess who it is, shows you how they're performing. And so what we'll do is we'll then use that data to actually go back to the hospitals and to the laboratories and say, is this the best way of doing it? You're getting it young, you're sitting on it for a while because you're trying to keep a hold of inventory just in case World War Three breaks out, which you have to plan for in case it does. And this is the impact on patients, though. And the downstream costs are, by the way, you have to have two more fridges than you previously did, and the cost of compliance of the Australian standard for new fridges is a lot more expensive, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. So actually we can now do things like, we can sit there and benchmark with the hospitals and the laboratories and say, well, we've got data from the last two or three or four years or however long we've had an interface in place. What would happen, and we do a little desktop exercise, if you decrease your inventory by this, and by this, and by this across the different blood groups and products? And you actually do a desktop exercise and go back over the last two years and say, there wouldn't have actually been a stock out because we're getting inventory every 15 minutes. We can identify where there would have been a stock out at all in that time period by decreasing inventory. So that's how you're starting to use the data in a, in a much more intelligent manner to make the, the life of laboratory staff quicker and easier.
but also make a difference to the supply chain. And over the last five years, really, working in a transfusion laboratory, the world has been turned upside down. Red cell demand has dropped in a way it's never dropped before. And they've had governments breathing down their necks saying, well, hang on, you now need to do this for a whole lot less money. And budget cuts have been pretty severe in many public pathology services. In the private world, I think it's safe to say we've seen some major changes and a lot of cost drivers there. And at the same time, I'm coming saying, but you've got to decrease wastage. And you've got laboratory staff who can't really work out what's going on with demand because it does fluctuate that much at the moment as everyone's changing their practice. But we're able to use the data and the systems to get them to also decrease inventory and to de decrease stock holdings. And over the last three years, we've seen red cell discards halve across Australia and no stock out. So, I mean, what we're doing is using the data in a way that actually makes it work for the hospitals. And that's all very well and good, and that's great. I can sit there and spend hours talking to someone after the fact. The other thing we're now starting to do is actually putting dashboards on the walls and laboratories. You get a big 55-inch screen, you hang it from the ceiling, you nail it on the wall, whatever you do. The MBA will come along and supply a little nice solid-state PC that links back over the hospital network to, the net, to our systems. And it'll actually display in real time, we'll pull information out of their laboratory information system. So this screen is actually showing in real time the inventory levels in that hospital, and the top half of the screen shows them what their inventory levels are. It's all colour coded. At the moment, and this is a really bad example, I've got to get a newer one. Um, all of those units are within the appropriate stock band, so there's no alerts. Otherwise, it's colour coded based on stock level of alerts, so if it drops below a certain level, alerts are generated and they can see what's happening. In the bottom half of the screen, we're doing very much, we're trying to help them actually manage their short expiry units. So yes, you might know you've got half a dozen units that expire in the next week. Trying to find those in a hurry when you're going through the fridge is a challenge. So we can actually say, well, actually, if you're after an O unit, there's an O neg unit, you've got one, two, three, four units that expire in less than a day. And here's the donation lot numbers. So it's actually giving staff the ability to say, I'll go to the fridge, find that particular unit, pull it out, and give it to a patient. You're meeting the clinical need, but at the same time, you're also making it easier for the staff members to do their job, and you're decreasing the overall wastage and the, de and the call on taxpayers. That's all well and good. But let's be realistic, things also come in peaks and troughs. So what we do at the bottom is actually give them graphs so they can see ahead of time what the expiry is going to be a week, two weeks, three weeks from now based on their stock levels and they can actually move product around between labs to decrease it. That's the first screen. I didn't bring you slides the other two. There's a th it's a three screen set that goes in rotation every 20 seconds. The second screen simply has information on the orders. What orders have you placed to the blood service? Where are they up to? So now bring in information from other systems and from other parties to say, you've placed 17 orders, the Red Cross say they've fulfilled these eight, they're on the way to you, these six they're still working on, the rest of them give good luck, um, to actually so that the laboratory staff can see what's coming through the door, where is it up to and so forth. Heaven forbid we have another um, supply crisis, but if we do, we have the ability on a third screen to inject a whole of information about the nat National Blood Supply Contingency Plan being activated and what alerts we're dealing with and how we're trying to manage that stock. So getting away from the traditional thing of Chinese whispers where everyone has a different story and acts differently, we can now, in real time, push out to the laboratory, this is what's happening, this is what the key messages are. Within half an hour of an activation now, we can, and it sounds horrible, we've done it a couple of times, we can spam all those staff in laboratories who are managing that supply in real time via email, text, fax, or on the screens and on the systems to say, this is what is occurring, this is what you need to do. And we had, in 2008, we had the activation of the red cell, uh, we had the activation of the contingency plan due to a red cell shortage. We activated the contingency plan, it was bad flu season, a few other odds and odds. The reason why it was activated was no one actually knew what was across the country in terms of stock. No one knew what the hospitals had. The Red Cross collected stock levels for the top 20 hospitals in the country. After that, no one knew. And so governments took a conservative approach Elective surgery was curtailed, oncology treatments were delayed and so forth to decrease the demand on red cells. Fast forward to three years ago, the Red Cross had a rather bad IT outage. It's really bad as an IT systems take down things and this is the, the danger of virtual medicine and all the automation at times. You've got to make sure it always works. Their IT systems went down. They fell back to manual processes for processing platelets and everything else. But the manual, they'd become so automated and decreased their staff that the manual processes, it took them four and a half days to get a platelet out the door from when it was collected. 
A platelet only has five days from when it's collected, so we had a major platelet shortage. By using the data we had from some sites that were interfaced, getting everyone else to do it by hand through the GUI, we actually managed to, we did not have to delay any patient treatments because of that. We were down to less than half a day's stock nationally for platelets across the country, but because we had visibility through the systems, because we could communicate a clear and simple message to all the staff involved in managing it, patient care was not compromised. To me, that's a pretty good outcome. An even better one would have been not having to do it in the first place, but that's life and it happened and we managed it. To me, that's the power of IT and that's where we're going in the next five to 10 years in pathology services. Taking the data, joining it up, and actually presenting it back in a way that's useful and clear and simple for the staff who are actually involved in treating the patients. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Abuse? Disagreements? <laughs> Let's see how controversial I've been. There isn't a chart published. We've done some analysis of the data. To be honest, apart from one or two laboratories, there's no, dis there's no discernible difference across public or private. There are a couple of public sites in two jurisdictions where they do get fresher blood than everybody else. There's no rhyme or reason to that other than historically they've always got fresher blood, so therefore they keep getting it. That is slowly being changed, but there is no discernible difference public versus private. Ironically, what we are seeing, the age at transfusion is generally higher in the publics than in the privates, which is actually counterintuitive. You normally expect the privates will generally cross-match, it goes in reserve three days, comes back backwards and forwards. But what's happening now is as part of the decreasing wastage, a lot of blood is being circulated back from the private labs to the major public labs, who are then transfusing patients at 35, 38 days old for blood. So the work we're now doing is how do we work with those private labs to say, well, actually, you keep it for 20 days and then send it back, or 25 days. So that's some of the changes. But the change in terms of what everyone gets from the Red Cross, it's pretty much the same. You also mentioned in your presentation there would be staff savings when you get interfacing with Coltrane. I would continue that the introduction of triple entry cost us labour to start with and probably just put him back. In some ways it may have. In some ways it may have. I would also point out, I suppose, blood net was never mandated. The take up of it was optional by laboratories. We went, we've got to about 95, 96% of usage across the country of laboratories saying actually, yes, there is some double handling, but on the benefit, it's still better for me to do it than not. So you're completely correct. Part of the saving getting back is something you invested up front. But also people, when they went live with blood net five, six, seven years ago, tell us, yes, we have to do more data entry, However, we don't also then spend half a day on the phone to the Red Cross chasing down where our orders are. And so, you're completely correct. You're only getting back some of the stuff I stole from you earlier. But at the same time, it's also been a constant change as the, as the systems and the, I suppose, the blood supply chain gets more efficient. Some of the true benefits you'll see next year when IG products are transformed. And last question. Um, now that we have all the data through you know, excellent NBA product, on the agenda of the NBA to start charging for the supply of blood units to the private sector? <coughs> Certainly not. Um, and I like my kneecaps, so I'm never going to propose charging the private sector for blood. Um, the reality is, in the majority of states and territories, you cannot legally do it. Um, some of you may recall the last government that, was, that tried to do it was New South Wales in 2008, um, and they got ripped to shreds by not only the private hospital association, and the whole range of private sector players, but every other government in Australia ripped them apart, limb from limb. In Australia, the way our blood is devolved, our budget is built, each state and territory pays 37% of the cost of products that are consumed in that state or territory. In each state and territory, they have different views on how they then devolve those charges down. In some cases, they, South Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, and Tasmania, yeah, I think, yep, they pass the cost down to the, for the publics, down to local public hospitals. They do not pass it down to the privates. 
Queensland is debating, do they actually get the local public hospitals to manage the private hospitals and the private blood banks in their geographic area? They've been debating that for two years and thankfully they haven't found a way of making it work, so I'm quite happy. Um, to my mind, the big costs are not, the cost of the product is minimal. I mean, that sounds horrible, it's a billion dollars a year, but the cost of the healthcare system, product costs are one fifth to one seventh the cost of a transfusion. So if you think about it, the product costs one billion dollars per annum, total cost to healthcare sector is five to seven billion. It's not the cost of the product we need to devolve, we need to get the use of the product better. So the NBA has no intent to pass down the cost of blood to the private sector, nor do we have the legal basis to do so. State and territory governments, who knows? <laughs> In some ways it would, and you'll have seen over the last two, three years, we've actually started introducing the price onto the bag of blood. So you get a bag of blood now, it says manufacturing cost is X. Over the next two years, you'll see for all the manufactured products, it'll actually have the price on it. So if you go to the community pharmacies today and you get your PBS medications, you'll see it's got the price on it. We're doing the same for blood products, for the manufactured ones as well as we've done for the fresh. That in itself, and putting the prices in blood net, has increased an awareness that this isn't a free product. We don't hear the stories the way you used to routinely hear them every second day of, yes, we use albumin to prime the pumps because it's free and a bag of saline costs $1.50. So putting a price on these things has made a difference. What we're trying to do is say, don't be too dogmatic in how you do it and push the price signals too far down in a very punishing way by actually charging because that will encourage bad behaviour. The work we're trying to do now is get people to cooperate so you move blood around where it's needed and that is Charging, to be honest, the biggest single impediment we face to people moving blood from lab A to lab B to lab C, but I paid for it, it's mine. And I'll stick it in my fridge and I'll throw it out at the end because I've paid for it. That costs us all more and that's more donors sitting on a chair that don't need to.